Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Follow the links in the description below. Hello and welcome to Furious Driving. And do you know, it's virtually a year since the last time we put poor old Hippo the Freelander under the MOT man's magnifying glass to see what could possibly be wrong with a 20 year old, much abused Land Rover of the budget end of the spectrum. Turned out there's a few bits last year and after it initially failed on unexpected rust in the bagging area and a CV boot being a bit not too perfect, we managed to scrape it through a pass with, well, let's close this boot up. The rear indicators, the amber lights had faded so I've replaced those bulbs since the advisory. The shock absorbers at the front are like misty of oil. They still feel absolutely fine and do the job perfectly. He listed one tyre as being cracking or perished on the offside rear. In fact, all four tyres were looking pretty old and past it. So we replaced all four of them with these rather fabulous Falcon Wildside All Terrains, which are really great tyres, great on road. And whenever I've used it in a field in wet, slimy mud and in snow, they've been good as well. And finally, suspension component mounting repair covered in under seal. So with Hippo's MOT due in just another few days, I booked it for a test next week and within minutes, basically, this happened. The back latch failed on the tailgate, which means I can't get an MOT because I can't shut the boot. In fact, it happened when I was out and the only reason I got the car home was because I had a fistful of bungees in the boot and had to tie it between the spare wheel and the headrest. The question is, why is this not latching shut? Before I even start looking at how well the sills have survived in the last year, and to be honest, they have got surface rust poking through the paint on both sides in places I haven't even repaired yet. So I'm gonna be grinding that back, rust proofing, rust killing, and repainting the sills before I do anything else. Changing the oil and making sure everything else still works on the car, no other rusty holes have appeared in the last 12 months. I've now got to work out why the boot doesn't shut. This is gonna be electronic or magical or mechanical. Right, okay, so we are in the bodywork area of the P-Scan. We've got a rather natty Apple Puck mouse from many years ago. This is touch screen, this little Raspberry Pi. We can actuate most of the relays in the car, so we can turn the hazard lights on permanently. Turn that off, we can honk the horn. Please stop, okay. Um, tail up window relay, but this is what we're actually looking for, tail door actuator. So we go over here, we can hear it clicking very, very faintly now I've pulled the handle. So I guess we're going to need to take that door card off and have a look inside because it's not, sh it sounds like something should be doing something, but it's got very quiet. Okay, so it is triggering. It is triggering like it should, but it's not, not latching. If you're curious how this big panel comes off the inside of the tailgate on a Freelander, first of all, there are four big screws all located at this end of the door, which to me suggests that product testing of these things showed that people like to try and shut the door with this door pocket and broke them in the early stages. Then you've got clips behind the plastic and behind the rubber. You need to get trim tool in there and pry it off. Go around the edge, the usual business, like every door card in the world. And then clips. So there you go, clips left and right. I've only broken one, that's not bad, unless it was broken already, I don't know. And we're inside. And the fact that this is flopping loose suggests to me that someone has been in here before me. As once we're in here, immediately, this is a side sidebar, we can immediately see the contacts for the heated rear window. And this is interesting because that has recently stopped working. And I, clicking, the, clicking the panel for the relay on the P-Scan, I could hear the click from the relay, which means either the screen elements are broken or the cabling to it is broken, so I'll check that while we're in here. So I've clicked the relay on the P-Scan and we're getting 12, sorry, yeah, 12.4 volts at the window and that's not getting hot, which means the elements are broken, so I've got to fix the elements job for another day. So as far as I can tell, there's basically two big torques, what are they? T40s holding this door lock in place. So it's very similar to the ones in the front of the car in both the doors of this thing and the Rover 75 and many other Rovers, with a Mini as well. The question is, how easy is it to remove from the vehicle? Uh, so probably not very. Okay, my bad, I didn't realize this is all one unit, so these two screws have got to come undone as well. And now, there we go, the whole thing just lifts out. 
apparently. And it's all electrical contacts to it, no, nothing mechanical. A big connector at the bottom, a white one, and a blue one on the side. I remember that, white one on the bottom, blue one on the side. That's going to be important later on. There is a little plastic clip holding the loom to the top of this thing. We need to pinch closed and then squeeze through the little hole. There we go, that's free. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, all of these tools that I'm using today, all this Draper stuff, which I'm using because it's great quality, and if it does have any problems, they sort it out under warranty, no issues at all, which is not a common occurrence. Um, all available on the Amazon affiliate link in the description below. Uh -huh. Okay, now hilariously, I've just taken this out of the door, I flicked the, the latch with the screwdriver and it's it's staying put, it's latching as it should do as if the door was shut. Which it shouldn't do. So let's reconnect it to some wires and see what happens when it's connected to the car. Remember we said white on the bottom, blue on the side. That test is now coming into play. So yeah, that works. Click it shut. That's now closed as it should be. Pull the door handle. It works, okay. I don't know why it's not doing things it should do. Right, so we are now refitted. And the question is, does it now work? I now click the thing across. What, no, it doesn't do it. That is bizarre. So it works when it's not in the car but it doesn't when it is in the car. That is really, really odd. I need to blow the window. That is so strange. Take it out the car again then. This is the solenoid in here. So this latch is shut like that. That pulls down to release it. Pull the handle. Okay, that pops back up again. So, what is the weak point in here? Working as it should. Well, that's interesting how much that moves. I had a look inside this thing, this big plastic cover comes off and you can sort of see inside a bit. Nothing looks to be broken. The only reason I can see if it's not latching, if this is pulled into release mode, then this won't latch across. But that's the only reason I can see for it not working because it works perfectly every time when it's not connected to the car. Latches straight up. Okay, fine. Let's put one bolt in and see what happens. Two in loosely. Works fine. Nipped up, we tightened up. Works. Put one screw in. Find out what point at which it stops working. I'm curious now. Two screws. Still works. Let's tighten up these things. Two tightened up. Still works. Okay, does it actually shut the door? Yes. Okay. Well, that makes no sense at all. Yeah, it works. I don't know why it chose to throw a massive wobbler about all that, but at least it works now. I'm not gonna put the trim back in in case it decides it's not gonna work again uh, in the next couple of days. So I'll, I'll just leave it as it is. I've put a bit of lithium grease in there, so maybe it's just a little bit dried up inside. I don't know. Anyway, it works now, so I can move on to servicing, checking everything else is all right. Hopefully it'll be all right now. Okay, so last year the MOT man had issues with the so-called chassis and the amount of it there still was attached to the car. So I had to do some pretty frantic last minute welding in frosty, horrible conditions. And this year, I wanna make sure I'm not gonna be facing anything like that before I go and present the car for a test. So I'm gonna get underneath it and have a good old look around. But one thing I have noticed is that uh, silver hammerite is surprisingly poor at rust protection, given that that's precisely what the stuff's supposed to be. And these pinch welds, which were painted in silver hammerite, have just rusted or got surface rust all the way over them. So. I need to be grinding that stuff back down straight away as well and make sure there's nothing hiding or growing underneath that paint and then properly rust kill it and properly prepare it so it's not looking disgusting. And incidentally, if you do a lot of outdoorsy stuff, these Hippo the Freelander furious driving enamel tin mugs are a perfect companion for your outdoors life. And the one saving grace of a Land Rover is you can get high enough off the ground without actually jacking the thing up. Oh, I've got, I've got some flaky paint just there. Okay, I'm gonna prod that with a screwdriver and regret it in a minute. This repair looks solid still, not very really pretty, but it's solid. And over to the back of the car, oh, I've got 
flaky metal on the pinch well, but I don't see any actual holes. I'm gonna grab a screwdriver and do some stabbing. You know, I think the job I planned for last summer was to get underneath this thing, wire brush everything off, and give it a good old clean up. That never happened, and so my temporary fixes are still here. It's one of those old jokes, isn't it? How do you know you own a Land Rover? Because you sweep up after it. Take your car away. Okay, go and fetch me a dustbin and brush. That feels solid though. Well, this side is pretty much the same actually. We've got, oh fudge. No, I was gonna say, we're all good, but we're not. We've got a massive great hole in the, in the, in the sill just here. Damn, okay. I mean, rust was inevitable on this thing, and thankfully it's only a small square that I've got to deal with just here. And only on one side so far. Ugh. This is just more flaky stuff, so I'll wire brush that in a second. I'll paint over that with some rust killer. And... It's murky and manky and horrible, but at least only one small hole. I mean, it could have been an awful lot worse. That's not massive. So a couple of minutes of grinding at the back of the car to clean up the little hole I've just found and move to the front of the car and in a surprise that will shock nobody there's a hole in the front as well so uh, yeah a double the amount of welding as I was planning to do in fact 100% more because I was planning on doing zero but right so I've been out here with the old spinny wheel of death for a few minutes and things have escalated quite dramatically so I started grinding away around the small holes and the small holes got bigger and then the loose flakes became holes which went on and on that at least is solid just there. And this one, well, it's double the size. <clears throat> I'm rather glad I didn't crash this car this year. Although the main centre structure does appear to be quite good still. I'll be honest, I've been hoping to avoid doing any actual welding until the temperatures and the gear got a little bit warmer uh, and did maybe double figures at least. I mean, this morning when I set out, first of all, it was two and a half degrees centigrade, which is on the low side for lying on the floor so I've left it till near midday and I actually had to wait until after the next day actually because um, the zinc primer wouldn't dry because it was so cold I uh, don't tell Mrs Figuris but I did actually pop these into the air fryer for a few minutes after I had dinner on um, because they weren't going to dry otherwise still had to wait till the next morning to whack them on the car though so Okay, the door works, the floor's solid. Just need to do a quick oil change in this thing because it's been two years I've had this car. I don't think I've ever changed the oil in it. I haven't done big miles, but that's still a bit of time. So I've got some oil, got sort of the Wix filter, and it's one of the weird cartridge ones, which can make a mess. And of course, because Freelander, you can't just dump the oil straight at the bottom. You've got to take the big underbody, under engine protection panel off first as well. Turns a five minute job into a half hour slog. Thanks. So this is a slightly inaccessible canister filter here at the front of the engine. So while it drains down, you need to get yourself a whatever the hell size this is. 36 millimetres apparently. And undo this. So this oil filter assembly does appear to be designed to be almost impossible to manoeuvre back in sensibly. Things if designers had to work on cars, they would look very different indeed. Now apparently these things take 6.8 litres of oil, which is a ridiculous amount of oil for such a small engine. It's only a two litre, but there you go. If that's what it asks for, that's what it asks for. And finally, as a little finishing touch, I don't want to get caught out on something really stupid. So a bit of one-shot screen wash to make sure, and I'll top up with some water as well, to make sure the washers have got some fluid in them because that'd be a dumb thing to fail on. 24 hours later. And the lights work. Okay, so it's pitch dark because the interior light has decided it doesn't work anymore, which it was working a few minutes ago. Never mind. But hey, Hippo rides again. We've got another MOT on this thing. Yay! Woohoo! Camera work in the dark by Furious Junior. Not that you know he's doing great camera work because it's pitch blooming dark in here. <laughs> but
So yes, we have a pass. I had to stop recording because the interior lights decided they weren't going to work when the car was moving and it was pitch dark. And despite Furious Junior's best efforts to record it, nothing was happening. But yes, no advisories, which is fantastic. And best of all, the MOT man was moving the car around and figured out where the grinding noise is coming from. It's the uh, back axle, he thinks. So I'm going to have to get some new oil for the back axle and try and sort that one out. And hopefully Hippo will stop making grindy noises because the other option would be to um, change the, the VCU, the viscous coupling unit, which I thought was the problem. Uh, that was new not that long ago before I bought the car. I was hoping it wouldn't be that because that'd be a massive pain. And I did, while I was doing the service, actually refresh the gearbox oil as well, hoping that maybe it'd be that. It's another 45 pounds spent, but uh, to no avail, unfortunately. Um, but hey, at least it's now done. Before I took it to the MOT, I did get the wire brush on the spinny wheel of death and I sanded off both sides of the car at the bottom of the, um, the pinch weld lower sill bits and absolutely went to town on it. So I used a spray on rust killer, first of all, to get into all the nooks and crannies and the crevices. Then once that had gone off, I used the uh, BDX rust killing primer to make doubly sure of it and then prime it and did two coats of that and then put a couple of coats of silver hammerite on top so hopefully we won't have any more uh, unsightly surface rust on there and my four repair panels were well, tidy enough to get me by but what I would like to do because I've now got a patchwork quilt of repair panels on this car there are four box sections running front to back and it's the outer ones that are the problem the inner ones are generally okay apart from some sort of flaky under seal which I need to wire brush all that off as well and and paint all of that in but no I would quite like to cut out the inner sections of that and box it in with thick new steel um, maybe get that done professionally just to make it like really strong really tough and definitely future proof and of course crash proofed as well because that's part of the crash structure of the car but anyway no Hippo rides again no advisories running well Hippo can continue to do the donkey work of the fleet it's currently put in about 1700 miles last year but it was 1700 hard miles doing everything from tip runs going to Wix to fill up with building materials, camping trips, you name it. If it's donkey work to be done, Hippo does the heavy lifting. So really glad to have this thing back on the road and also really glad not to have to worry about doing any extra work on this thing <laughs> to try and rectify anything because for once we got through the MOT first time, which was a massive relief. Anyway, right, tomorrow back on to the Mini or the V8 or something else. For now, we're done. Thanks for watching, like, subscribe, all that kind of business and we'll see you again soon.